Yes. Okay. Um, so this is uh, just, um, you know, in conversation with Dr. Kalpalata, um, it seemed like there may be a utility to just having a, a brief update on some selected topics for COVID-19 treatment and prevention. And so, uh, you know, being sort of new to this gathering, I hope that I, uh, you know, the topics that we're going to cover today uh, will be of some use to you as uh, you are in the middle of, uh, of the situation in India. So um, let me just actually, yeah, that's better. So this, this, uh, this diagram you may, uh, many of you may have seen already, just a quick a recap of uh, the stages of uh, COVID-19 infection, um, because when we uh, talk about some of the therapeutic um, issues, uh, of course, this, uh, this plays a big role. So as you all know very well, uh, much too well at this point, uh, this is the severity of illness, the x-axis is the time course. So early in the infection, of course, it's the time of uh, primarily viral replication. Um, and this is uh, sort of uh, marked by constitutional symptoms, low grade fever, you know, all the, you know, muscle aches, diarrhea, headache, etc. sometimes a dry cough and so on. And but as um, as time goes on, again, as you are all very familiar, the phase of viral replication sort of tails off and then you have the very robust host inflammatory response that begins uh, sort of uh, primarily in the second week, but can really amplify. Uh, a lot of times that is marked by the onset of uh, lung involvement um, and uh, early ARDS marked by uh, shortness of breath, hypox hypoxemia, and then uh, well, initially pneumonia, of course, and then it progresses on to ARDS, uh, SIRS, shock, etc. And the last stage is uh, definitely is marked by these elevated inflammatory markers, uh, primarily CRP, LDH, IL-6, etc. All of you are very familiar with this. I know you're dealing with this on a regular basis. The utility of looking at a uh, diagram like this is just also to remind ourselves of some of the therapies and at what stage some of these therapies are most useful. So for example, um, if you look on the, on the bottom um, sort of panel over here, if you take things like remdesivir, etc., et et convalescent plasma infusions, those may be used sort of early on. I'm going to touch on hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. This, was a, this is an older uh, sort of slide. And, and here you can see that in the primary, in the initial part, we're most, most interested in trying to tackle the viral response or the viral replication and, and suppress it. Um, and whereas later on, uh, there's, there's a need to, uh, to suppress the inflammatory uh, reaction. So, and then just a, a really quick uh, primer on the viral life cycles and opportunities for therapeutic intervention. Again, as we all know, this is the virion spike protein, the envelope, the membrane protein, and the nucleocapsid here. The viral entry blockers, as again, we all know, spike protein um, interacts with the ACE2 receptor, which is how the virus enters the cell. And certainly some of the therapies that may be considered are um, work at this stage to block viral entry. So we're talking convalescent sera, some of the monoclonal antibodies, some of the small molecules which actually bind to uh, the spike protein. Um, some of the other um, uh, sort of therapies like chloroquine, for example, they are thought to not only have some anti-inflammatory properties or initially were, again, I'm going to sort of get into that a little bit, and act to lower the pH of the endosome. Um, other therapies uh, have, uh, have uh, sort of other effects on sort of the, the uh, membrane fusion, et cetera. Um, when the, the, uh, the viral genome is released, we, uh, this is where all of the uh, viral replication inhibitors, uh, some of them are inhibit the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. This is where you have the remdesivir, the favipiravir, uh, et cetera. And then um, there, you know, for the entrance of the virus into the cell, there is also a transmembrane uh, serine protease, uh, which is a host enzyme. And some of these um, um, therapeutics uh, are thought to work at this stage too. But again, just a quick overview of that. 
So this is something that you are all familiar with. And I thought that I would just uh, start with this and uh, look at some of uh, primarily the drugs and talk a little bit about some of the drugs that are utilized in the various uh, stages of the disease, primarily really mild disease, because again, this is where the antiviral um, effects are, are really uh, sort of uh, necessary. And I will touch on uh, remdesivir and its uh, potential use as well. So uh, uh, these guidelines list ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. So it might be useful to look at some of that data and then look at uh, the uh, data to support remdesivir and tocilizumab. So again, this is uh, just the, the part that I'm going to focus on for the next couple of slides. So if we look at uh, ivermectin initially, this is a widely used drug that treats, uh, that is used to treat strontyloidiasis, onchocerciasis, and scabies. Um, it is thought to act by inhibiting the host importin, which is a nuclear transport protein that's used for the, by the virus to transport uh, viral proteins into the nucleus and may have some effects to, uh, um, uh, you know, some anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory effects as well. However, a lot of the interest in ivermectin was uh, triggered by an initial in vitro study, which was uh, done in Vero cells, uh, where they found that um, the addition of ivermectin to uh, sars cov cells actually abrogated the viral replication as measured in the supernatant, etc. However, the problem with this is that the concentration that was utilized, that was, um, that resulted in about, about a 94, almost 100% efficacy in squashing viral replication was about a hundred fold higher than is achievable uh, by using the doses that are uh, approved for um, human beings. So of course, um, there have been multiple, I'm sure you're, you're well aware of some of these multiple clinical trials using ivermectin. Some uh, did show a shorter time to resolution of symptoms, a reduction of inflammatory markers, reduction in, in viral clearance. However, um, it's extremely difficult to draw some conclusions uh, with uh, from this, as we'll see in the next couple of slides, because there's such a variation in study design. You know, most of them had pretty small sample sizes. Um, they enrolled people at different stages in, in the clinical um, uh, course, uh, they had uh, different uh, drug regimens, etc. So, in uh, so specifically, the quality of the evidence is is quite patchy, and even the meta analyses that have been done um, are challenged by just the quality of the trials that they deal with. So, as I said, sample sizes for the most part were small. There was all sorts of various doses and schedules uh, utilized. Many of these studies were open label and therefore subject to bias. Another huge problem that was that, especially early in the pandemic, many people uh, received various concomitant medications, such as doxy, such as hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, steroid, zinc, etc. I mean, there was there was a lot of uh, polypharmacy, so it was uh, difficult to elucidate the effect of the ivermectin. Um, finally, um, the severity of COVID-19 and the outcome measures were not really well well defined. And finally, much of this evidence is uh, is accessible on preprint servers, and so has not really been through the pre peer review process. Having said all that, um, this is a very busy slide. I just put it up there only to demonstrate to you um, just the wide variety of types of studies that there are. For example. This one from these, both of these are from Bangladesh, and um, you can see that the that the type of ivermectin regimen that they used was quite different in both of these. Um, they showed the the Ahmed trial showed faster viral clearance, but not faster time to symptom resolution. Part of the problem here is that you can't always equate the time to viral clearance to actually um, clinical improvement, and so some of these markers. Have not sort of been validated as actual biomarkers. So if the vir if if you are able to reduce the virus, you may think logically that that translates into clinical improvement, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, similarly, um, uh, the Chowdhury uh, trial did not show any difference in time to PCR negativity or or time to resolution of symptoms. Um, Hashim showed uh, with a this was. A, unblinded single center uh, trial in outpatients with mild to moderate COVID, where they said that um, 
uh, ivermectin may shorten the time to recovery. But again, this was unblinded. They did a lot of post hoc uh, subgroup analyses, and uh, there were um, they 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 didn't sort of really um, control very well for competing mortality in uh, patients with uh, different uh, severity of disease. Plus, you'll see here that there were a considerable number of concomitant medications. So once again, then it becomes really difficult to ascertain the, um, the effect of ivermectin. Similarly, uh, with this last one here, which uh, shows, um, you know, which enrolled people with mild, moderate and severe disease and tried to sort of tease out um, the effect. Again, they did show some reduction in inflammatory markers um, and uh, some reduction in clinical improvement and reduction in mortality. But again, they, um, it, was, uh, it, it was sort of very difficult to, to sort of tease out these effects. So, so if you look at some of the meta-analyses, so Hill, um, also on a preprint server, looked at six randomized controlled trials out of a total of 56. So sort of cherry-picked some of these trials, uh, found that there was a reduction in mortality and a reduction in inflammatory markers. Uh, as well as increased viral clearance. But again, really cherry picked the number of trials out of the 56 known trials at that time. Several of these were open label. There were variations in trial design, patient populations, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the, the data is, is sort of very messy. Um, you know, This is another meta-analysis that looked at 12 studies and more than 7,000 patients, but finally concluded that the quality of the evidence as well as the certainty was insufficient to recommend. And certainly uh, the WHO, NIH, et cetera, um, and no one has uh, recommended ivermectin to be used. Um, the available evidence, again, I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail, but does not support the use of azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine in the treatment. Um, again, specifically the uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine in um, you know the several many trials that have been uh, completed produce little or no reduction in mortality when compared to standard of care and can be associated with um, a, a serious cardiac and other adverse events. This um, is just a table that I pulled out of um, uh, an article in NEJM where they basically look at two of the big trials that used hydroxychloroquine, so the solidarity and the recovery trials, as well as a handful of others. And if you look this, these two columns here, so this is, these are the solidarity results, these are the recovery results, again, stratified by the use of oxygen and, and uh, ventilation uh, at uh, entry in the trial. This is hydroxychloroquine versus control, and the deaths are observed, expected. So if you look at this um, uh, forest plot, you can see that if you look at this, uh, this uh, side uh, um, indicates hydroxychloroquine was worse, this is hydroxychloroquine better. And you can see that, you know, when you look at the whole total, stratified total, um, including 15 smaller trials in addition to solidarity and recovery, there was really no discernible effect uh, of hydroxychloroquine. So this is uh, just going back to the guidelines. Um, uh, you know, the, it recommends EUA and off-label use, pot uh, potentially in specific circumstances for remdesivir and tocilizumab. So again, if you um, just looking at some of the selected remdesivir trials, um, you know, Probably many of you are familiar with the adaptive COVID-19 treatment trial or ACT-1. And in this trial, um, remdesivir did reduce time to clinical recovery in hospitalized COVID patients who were on, on supplemental oxygen. The, uh, the uh, reduction was from 15 days to about 11 days. There was some survival benefit, but there was no observed benefit in those who required higher levels of oxygen support, uh, those who are on high flow, those who are on any sort of non-invasive, um, certainly invasive mechanical ventilation or ECMO. Um, there was no survival benefit in those patients and none seen in those with mild to moderate uh, COVID-19. The solidarity trial also looked at um, uh, remdesivir, uh, did not show any, uh, any decrease in in-hospital mortality when compared to uh, standard of care. 
Uh, another trial with almost 600 patients showed uh, that uh, moderate COVID pa patients with moderate COVID-19 had better outcomes with five days of remdesivir compared to standard of care. And similarly, when there were, uh, the, uh, the trial looked at different uh, durations of remdesivir therapy, 10 days versus five days, uh, they, uh, they found that patients on, on the shorter duration of remdesivir had better outcomes, uh, had equivalent to those who received 10 days and better outcomes in general than those who received standard of care. So these are just, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on tocilizumab except to say that um, in these two large trials, the recovery and remap cap in patients who have severe to critical uh, COVID with a rapid respiratory decompensation, uh, most of whom receive steroids. Also, there is a mortality benefit um, of uh, fortosi uh, versus uh, standard of care. So just uh, like I said at the beginning, this is a, a little bit of a hodgepodge of uh, different, um, uh, you know, pieces of uh, data and information that may be useful for you all. Uh, so I wanted to just address the, the whole um, issue of variants a little bit because, of course, um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion and a lot of emerging data, although there's much that we still don't know about, um, you know, the, the types of variants uh, emerging, what um, impact this has on transmissibility, infectivity, what impact it has on um, vaccine coverage, etc. So again, just a real quick uh, uh, recap of the life cycle. And if you, uh, so uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, which, um, are, which in general are more prone to random mutations compared to DNA viruses. Random genetic drift is, is a mechanism as well as natural selection, which often makes the virus more infectious while being less virulent in general. Many of these variants contain mutations on the, on the uh, spike protein receptor binding domain, which is important when we um, you know, talk about the, the coverage uh, with vaccines. And they are widely speculated to make SARS-CoV-2 more infectious. Um, I mean, the, the data on this is all just kind of emerging. So it, it's a little all over the place. It's difficult to synthesize. But really, um, a quick look, uh, you know, the B117 mutation first arose in the UK. Um, all of these mutations have the, these, this particular mutation in the receptor binding domain. So the B117 was, came to prominence in the UK. 1351 was in South Africa. And of course, um, in India, I think uh, since February of this year, uh, beginning in Maharashtra and spreading outwards, uh, the B1617 seems to have really taken hold in many parts of uh, India. This is uh, associated with some of these mutations, and the only importance here is to understand that some of these mutations actually lead to uh, increased strength of binding uh, of the spike protein to the ACE2 receptor, and so you can see that they, that may have uh, important um, uh, downstream effects in terms of its uh, transmissibility and infectivity. So most of the hundred, um, the hundred most observed mutations in this particular analysis uh, are, are associated with stronger binding, resulting in more infectious variants. And the uh, the Indian variant uh, six one seven has a couple of different mutations that render the virus more infectious and. Um, increase its ability to evade vaccines. So uh, again, I, I emphasize that there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in this area. We don't really understand uh, or fully know really what, um, what kind of coverage is provided by the vaccines. Um, however, given the fact that most of the um, vaccines that are, are commonly used um, certainly, Covishield, uh, to a lesser extent, Covaxin in India, um, you know, have uh, robust uh, protective efficacy against the first uh, variation or the natural strain. And so, even if the the um, the protection against these uh, strains decreases by even twenty percent, you're still looking at at least uh, sixty, sixty-five, poss possibly higher uh, efficacy in terms of protection. So, still worth uh, definitely worth doing. So, and then again, making a quick change, I wanted to address uh, the mucromycosis. Of, of course, this has uh, become a huge problem for 
all of you uh, dealing with patients uh, in India. I just want to emphasize that over time, um, the incidence in India has been higher than many other parts of the world. Uh, the primary risk factor for this seems to be uh, uncontrolled diabetes and DKA. With this, um, the primary presentation seems to be the rhino orbital orbitocerebral, which is uh, being seen now. And you can see here, um, between 1990 and 2007, a single tertiary care institution in India had a significant um, number of cases, much higher than, than many uh, places see here. The reasons are a little unclear, it may have to, uh, you know, to do with temperature and humidity. Uh, and overall, in this particular paper, they estimated that the overall prevalence in, an, in normal times, pre-COVID, uh, was uh, about uh, 0.14 cases per thousand population in India. And then in a meta-analysis um, uh, in this particular paper, they described an overall prevalence of um, rhino um, uh, uh, orbitocerebral at about 58%. That's the most common. Cutaneous is about 14 pulmonary about six. And interestingly, India is one of the few places uh, that's, that uh, where uh, isolated renal mucormycosis uh, uh, appears to be um, make up some of these cases. So again, this is the order mucoralis. Uh, it's, um, uh, and these are some of the species uh, that make up these, uh, this order of mucor. The spores exist very widely in nature and are spread in soil, air, food, and decaying organic material. There have been outbreaks um, um, in the past uh, related to contaminated bandages, related to um, you know uh, so sometimes uh, other contaminated uh, um, uh, things in the patient environment, as well as uh, contamination with with soil, etc. So typically, the spores can exist as commensals in the nares of, of healthy people. If that patient becomes suppressed, they are uh, have uncontrolled diabetes. They are on steroids um, for a long period of time. These this fungus can germinate um, in the paranasal sinuses, and then, as you all know, it's very locally invasive, uh, often very quick, uh, very quickly occurring in less than four weeks. Risk factors are DM, as I said, steroids. Um, uh, I iatrogenic immunosuppression, AIDS, hematological malignancies are a big one. And so many of you are, are no doubt very familiar with the, uh, the uh, sort of clinical presentation. And again, histological um, features include infiltration of blood vessels, etc. So, uh, you know, treatment options, of course, uh, surgical debridement is, is, is often very necessary. Liposomal amphotericin B, posaconazole, isavuconazole are the main mainstays of treatment. And this is just, um, you know, some of you may obviously have seen um, much of this, but uh, this is um, wound infection after a car accident. Uh, this is uh, ptosis and, um, uh, in, uh, you know, edema as well as um, maxillary swelling. This is again, uh, proptosis and uh, you know, uh, erythema and swelling of the eyelids, uh, cavernous sin sinus syndrome. Um, here is rhinocerebral mucormycosis in, in a child. Um, this is, I just wanted to show you the black eschar in case um, some of you may not have seen it. Uh, this one is occurring on the palate. This is an ulcer on the side of the face, etc. And this last one is, um, is uh, I think, on the uh, ear, I think, or cheek. And so um, other fungal infections, the white fungus that has been described um, in Patna, um, as far as I can make out, I, I don't have a very good idea of looking at the, some of the, the, um, uh, the uh, material that I could find. It looks like this is Canada. And of course, um, you know, there, there is definitely an increase in other fungal infections, such as invasive aspergillosis in the setting of COVID-19. And uh, just a reminder that risk factors for Canada are, you know, overuse of antibiotics, a prolonged steroid use, hospitalization, presence of indwelling lines, immunosuppression, et cetera. And then similarly for aspergillosis, immunosuppression, and prolonged steroid use. So I wanted to just um, end with uh, basically saying, whoops, that um, I think when we look at the treatment of uh, COVID in terms of the drugs that are used, um, a lot of the time, the, the drugs that seem, I, I also have many family members who 
have been uh, have contracted COVID, and so have heard anecdotally from them that they are prescribed many antibiotics in addition to some have been uh, prescribed steroids as outpatients as well. So just a, a, a plea to kind of really consider um, whether these are really necessary. There's not a lot of uh, really good evidence to support the use of azithro or doxycycline early in the course of the disease. Certainly, once somebody is in ICU with pneumonia or ARDS, often a very prolonged and complicated course, they um, definitely do need antibiotics at, at times when they have super infections, they have line associated infections. But again, um, just, uh, um, you know, some of these things are potentially also contributing to the increase in cases of mucor as well. So I think I'll, I'll just uh, stop there and uh, turn it back to uh, Dr. Ramohan as well as Dr. Kalpalata. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Gopinath. I'm, I might have a question myself, so before we ask the others, uh, I was curious about the Vero cell model. Was that ever replicated? Because there was so much time spent on ivermectin in the last eight, nine months. It's a pity that when there is a model, an animal model, was it ever replicated in lower doses or was abandoned altogether? Uh, no, actually, that's a very good question. We, um, you know, we've been kind of looking out for that as well. And just very recently, I think um, just last week, um, in fact, there was a there was a paper published. Uh, I can get the reference for you, but anyway, it was it was actually um, uh, showing that ivermectin did not uh, have any benefit in cells that were replicating in epithelial in 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 epithelial cells that were infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2. So there has always been a question of whether uh, it was just something about the model in which they, they uh, looked at the initial ivermectin effect, that um, whether it was just related to that particular model or whether it was replicable. And so we're waiting for other uh, pieces of information, but this particular paper seemed to say that it was not replicable in, this, in the second model. It would have been great. It's such a pity that we don't have anything to prevent. Um, so that, that leads me to the next question. Only now, today, in the upper right-hand corner of your ICMR recommendation dated May 19th, I still see chloroquine. So is there some kind of a peace arrow that has been figured out, but why would they still leave it there? You know, I, I, I cannot answer that question. I mean, I think that was the purpose of showing you some of the data. Um, the data does not really support the use of it. I, I am not sure why, why it's still uh, part of the guidelines and maybe one of our colleagues, um, you know, uh, practicing in India would be able to enlighten us with that. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure why. I, uh, I'm supposed to monitor my chat screen and ask you some questions. Uh, let's see what do. Oh yes, role of starting budesonide nebulization for admission. Can it reduce progression from moderate to severe disease? I might defer that to Dr. Kalpalata. Do you want to take that one? Yes. Yeah, I mean budesonide. Um... I mean, it can be used, but I don't think it will really reduce the progression from moderate to severe disease. Uh, nebulization is, uh, you know, really not that much gets absorbed into the into the lungs and systemic systemic suppression of um, um, inflammation may not happen with that. That has been recommended by CMR. I see that. Okay. Um... Dr. Sudhakar, otherwise we're going to go to Dr. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramya, and uh, please stay on. Uh, there may be more questions in the chat box towards the end. Once Dr. Kalpalata completes the uh, presentation and discussion, probably both of you can join for the discussion. Now, some more questions that are going to pop up. Sure, we'll do, Dr. Sudhakar. Thank you.
Can you slide. see my screen? Yes, yes. If you could go to the slideshow on the top. Okay. I'll... Okay. You can see my screen, right? Yes, very well. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Sudhakar Garu and uh, Dr. Ramohan Garu for inviting me. Um, I was uh, very impressed to know that uh, you have been doing this for the past one year that Dr. Ram Mohan was uh, um, informing me about. Uh, what I thought I will do is, um, it's uh, kind of, I know that you have been uh, listening to many people, but since I'm coming in for the first time, I've had a brief conversation with uh, Dr. Sudhakar Garu. And I thought maybe I'll really start with the very basics. And at the... Um, uh, risk of um, uh, probably sounding very simple. I thought maybe I'll start um, at that level and then try to build up because I, I don't think this will be my first time and I'd like to come back several um, several sessions. Um, um, <clears throat> this seems to be the new normal. I just want to go out with you. I wasn't sure whether it's a part of your slide. Shiva, can you shut them off, please? I just want to go. Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead, please. Uh, your your audio is off. Uh, Siva, reopen her, please. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, please. Okay, um, I just um, having practiced for many years, um, uh, close to forty years in the ICU. I just wanted to make some take the liberty of making some observations as well. I said this is really a first time we are seeing uh, this kind of a situation. When did we see an infectious disease that affected someone, you know, and is seriously ill and can even die from it? When did we see up to maybe 8% of our colleagues infected from patients, actually? Um, and when did we see a lockdown for the world and we are the new soldiers with boots on the ground in the trenches with definite serious risk to ourselves and perhaps to our families as well? When did we see hospitals filled with patients with one disease? And when did we in the recent past see so many patients younger than 50 critically ill and die from one disease? And when did we see ophthalmologists and neurosurgeons take primary care of ICU patients? And when was there a healthcare crisis where we could not volunteer because we also were needed locally? And when did we think that construction workers can donate N95 and the oil industry workers can make us some safe intubation boxes. In fact, we got a lot of donations early on of N95 from construction companies. And when did sports arenas become hospitals? And when did the whole world stay home, but we were afraid to socialize? So this seems to be a first and probably first um, one of one occurrence in about 100 years. So we, we started seeing patients, um, a surge of patients a little later than New York and California and uh, Washington state sometime in uh, March of 2020. And this has been a year of challenge and opportunity. I um, consider my experience in the last one year into four buckets. One is uh, administrative. So there were a lot of things that will change from hospital to hospital in the country to country, but generally uh, developing a surging plan. What happens if you have a whole hospital filled with um, you know, COVID patients or ICU capacity, how we increase to staffing plan? How do you staff it, not just creating the beds? But most importantly, respond to ever-changing evidence and pharma supplies. I mean, there was so much of short supply of various drugs at the peak of the uh, surge for us. And I'm sure you're experiencing the same. And, and another thing is how do you keep up the morale and build resilience to the uh, uh, healthcare workers, which becomes very, very important because this is more of a marathon where you have to sustain your increased level of activity and uh, vigilance. And um, 
how do you interact and really share your experiences at least um, in our place, we had a, a Texas Medical Center I, ICU director's weekly forum. So once a week, we would speak and we adapted a lot of practices that were working at one hospital or the other. And then in Houston, we had a, a WhatsApp group of critical care physicians of about 210 physicians that we shared our experience right from the beginning. So some of this may work for you, some of this may not, but this is what worked for us. Second bucket is uh, developing a lot of protocols and guidelines and uh, either modifying them for COVID or actually developing some of the new, big, new algorithms. Uh, one is for severe hypoxemic respiratory failure algorithm. Code blue, um, there is a, a huge um, risk to the healthcare givers, especially before the vaccine days that when you intubated or did a uh, resuscitation on a patient that you would contract. So initially um, in New York and other places, uh, there was a question whether you even resuscitate, resuscitate a patient. So we en went to a mechanical uh, device called Lucas, which uh, saved a lot of people being in the room. So you develop a lot of protocols and what kind of protective equipment uh, is needed for different procedures, use of steroids, anticoagulation, all these protocols needed to be developed. What about some of the innovations? As uh, you see the need and you know, I saw that in some of the questions from other facilities, how do you protect healthcare workers from going into the room or going to the bedside so many times? So there have been several innovations that I have seen first time in, our, in these decades of practice is to have IV pumps outside the patient room. You make a hole in the wall and run all the pumps outside. Some of the ventilators can also be run from outside and uh, redesign the code teams and mechanical devices. Um, and bedside ultrasound proved to be very, very extremely helpful for us in a rapid assessment of uh, patient uh, instead of taking the you know, larger ultrasound uh, equipment to the bedside. And we realized that we can get pretty good images even in a prone patient. Uh, how, and then a lot of um, outreach uh, through publications, community interviews, and so on. So these are some of the uh, opportunities as well as challenges uh, that are faced. I'm sure you, you are facing as well. I just want to uh, touch upon some concepts and controversies, and then maybe take one or two um, at a time. One of the uh, concepts and the controversies is the happy hypoxic. These patients very early on in March, we had, a, um, we had a comment by one of the physicians practicing in our area that I see this patient who is 70% um, saturated and then she's talking to me. I don't know, you know, this is just a vaccine. So they have been um, happy hypoxic. There's something called a patient self-induced lung injury. Uh, which we can talk about uh, later on, which is uh, very important because pa patients look good, but they may be taking large breaths, which may not be helpful to the lung. And what is the oxygen escalation uh, algorithm? Uh, high flow uh, nasal cannula role, non-invasive ventilation, proning. Um, we used to do very rarely in the ICU before. It has become a common practice. Uh, why do you prone? Who do you prone? And how long do you prone? Do you intubate early or late? Because these patients may look okay. As I mentioned, they're happy hypoxics. Do you paralyze these patients or not? Do you code or not? Is this ARDS any different? It is called CARDS or COVID-associated ARDS. Steroids, anticoagulation, hyperimmune syndrome. Where, why do patients suddenly deteriorate and what are the problems of prolonged illness and post ICU syndrome, both for the patients, their families, as well as frontline workers, and what kind of protective equipment um, do you use? So just to give some relative numbers, if we have 100 patients who get COVID infection, 85 are mild and they can be managed at home. 15 may get admitted to the hospital and only about a quarter of these patients who are admitted to the hospital require ICU level of care. And again, even in those patients admitted to the hospital, half of them can be managed without intubation or being on a ventilator. So this is, was one of the, my earlier slides where we have, where it was shown that both Wuhan 
um, 21 uh, out of 191 patients, 50% had respiratory failure, a third had ARDS, and half of the patients can be managed without ventilator support, and about a fifth of them were managed with high flow nasal cannula. In the remdesivir trial where they had like a thousand patients, supplemental oxygen was required in 40%, high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation was in 18% and ventilator was only required in 25%. This was our earlier data, very similar uh, in our hospital as well. These are some of the numbers from our hospital. Total number of, I just want to concentrate on the last one. These are different surges and different admissions. Our worst time was from June to August where we had a thousand admissions and total admissions were about 2000. Um, ICU admissions 220, as I mentioned, it's only like about 10% of that. And the mortality was anywhere from 25 to 35%. So why do these patients have ha uh, silent hypoxia? So this is what I was mentioning, one of my colleagues saying, I have a patient 77% on room air, she's sitting and talking to me, she may just do fine, but our poor understanding of aerosolization, we may end up uh, putting her on a ventilator. So there's some um, uh, theories about uh, why the patients have this silent hypoxia. Um, one of them is that the elderly patients have decreased perception and diabetics may have a low response. Um, other thing is that oxygen, the, the response um, to the hypoxia is by, by, by a carotid body stimulation, where you have ACE2 expressed on the carotid body and the nasal mucosa. That's why you have anosmia and perhaps this is the reason they're not able to uh, perceive uh, the hypoxia. So uh, just coming to the basics, since we are saying that half of the patients can be uh, managed um, just on non-invasive means, what are the options that are available for us? Just going through the basics, what are uh, oxygen delivery systems? There are some low flow systems, there are some high flow systems. Low flow systems are basically nasal cannula, which you're all familiar with, face mask and non-rebreather mask, and high flow systems are venti mask or venturi mask or a high flow nasal cannula or HFNC as it is called an intubation, which is a closed system. So going from a nasal cannula to a venturi mask, you can give up to 50%, then to the non-rebreather mask, non-invasive ventilation, high flow nasal cannula and intubation. So basically you can deliver the oxygen through an oxygen cylinder that is pressurized gas and you get the air uh, through a flow meter and you run, run it through a water bubble or a bubble humidifier and this goes to the patient through a nasal cannula. Just remember that you know uh, it doesn't matter how you deliver oxygen, whether by nasal cannula, um, whether by through, from a cylinder or from an oxygen concentrator, or the wall piped in oxygen, all of them are less than 3% humidified. They're very, very dry gases. So unless you have very good humidity, normally when we breathe air, it is 100% humidified and heated to a body temperature by the time it reaches the carina because we have a very good system in the nose uh, of humidifying and heating to the body temperature. So we, we are very comfortable when we breathe. Whereas here coming from the wall, it's about less than 3% humidified. So if you're giving anybody nasal cannula or any oxygen without humidity, they cannot tolerate more than one to three liters or four liters. Once you go to six liters, it starts burning your nose and you will have some chest tightness. So the oxygen concentrators have been very much uh, uh, popular uh, in this uh, pandemic in India. Normally oxygen concentrators, we have been using them in uh, for example, COPD patients, when we put them on uh, chronic um, 24 hours a day, um, low flow oxygen. So the oxygen concentrators are perfect for those kind of patients because they basically absorb the nitrogen. They have a zeolite um, inside uh, frames and they absorb the nitrogen. They just, uh, from the 80% nitrogen is absorbed, 20% that is remaining is the oxygen, which is the major gas in room air. And basically it runs through this humidifier and from here it goes to the nasal cannula. 
So this again, uh, this is a very poor uh, humidity. It just bubbling through the water. So it's not very high, but since you're not intubating, the flows are not very high. It's only one to five liters. Patients in general, they tolerate it okay. What is the advantage of this versus the cylinder? Oxygen coming from a cylinder. In cylinder, there's a limited supply of pressurized oxygen. So once this runs out, and the cylinders are different sizes from A to most commonly people use are E cylinders that they carry around when they come to see you in clinic or something. And H cylinders are very large capacity. Sometimes we have in the hospital for heliox and with various other types of gases. So oxygen cylinder, what comes out of it is similar on both of them, except this is unlimited supply as long as there is air uh, you know, it will make oxygen, but it can only make one to four liters of pure oxygen. Some of them will sell you that you're getting 15 liters. I can increase this flow rate to anything, but it may not be 100% oxygen coming out. The oxygen generating plants that, um, uh, for example, something like this, they can generate up to 200 to 500 liters or 1,000 liters per minute, which are usually used for hospital supply. So uh, percentage of oxygen delivered through a nasal cannula, again, depends on the flow. If it's from one to six, uh, six liters, maybe you can get up to 45% of oxygen even at six liters because your minute ventilation may be much higher or your flow rate may be much higher. So you're diluting with room air. It's not a closed system like a endotracheal tube. Um, again, if a patient has a very low flow rate, for example, little old person who has a shallow breathing, even at uh, four liters, you may get much higher oxygen because they may not be breathing a lot more than what you're giving them. So if a patient has very large uh, requirement or have a very high minute ventilation, even at, at six liters, it may not be 45%, it may be 25% because you are diluting it with a lot of air. So you have to remember that it's an open system. You don't know exactly how much the patient is getting. So you go by uh, your oxygen saturation as an endpoint. One of the, some of the systems I'm sure you're familiar with, they're called venti masks. What these have is basically oxygen is coming here at 100%. And here there's a disc of different sizes and different, these are color coated. And what actually they have is, for example, blue is supposed to be 24%. So the lower the percentage of here, it goes all the way to 60%, the, the hole in this disc is smaller. So the hole in this is uh, smaller. So you're entraining a lot of air from the side. So actually the lower percentage of oxygen, you have total gas flow that is hitting the face at the mask level of almost 50 to 100 liters. So if you are giving it a low uh, percentage of oxygen, they, if they have a high minute ventilation, that means they have air hunger, they're trying to breathe very fast, still it satisfies them and they still get 24%. So the higher you go, as you know, the total gas flow hitting the face is less. So if my, there's something called minute ventilation, there's a, liter flow or min, uh, the liter of air that you need per minute. So if you're air hungry or you're septic, you're taking or you're having small breathing in diabetes, for example, your liter flow that you want per minute, it's usually about four times your minute ventilation. If a minute ventilation is five, your liter flow requirement may be about 20. But if you are septic or having air hunger, your liter flow requirement may be 60 liters, 80 liters. So if in that case, if you're just giving much less liter flow, they'll dilute room air. So exactly how much you're giving in venti masks, the lower it is, you can, you can match their demand. So this is just a plain mask and this is a venti mask and I, I shared the different discs uh, with you. There's something called a non-rebreather mask. This again is not a high flow situation. Here, the 100% oxygen is coming here uh, through some bubble humidifier and there is a reservoir. This has to be full. And on the mask, there's a one-way valve, like a, a rubber valve. So when the patient takes a breath, they take air from this bag. And when they breathe out, it really, they're not 
entraining room air because this is closed. One side is open, one side is closed. So this is as close to 100% oxygen as you can give. The only way you can give 100% oxygen is this bag has to be full. If it is flat, then patient is entraining room air from the other side. So one of the important ones that we use quite a bit are ox uh, high flow oxygen delivery systems. This has been probably in the last 10 years uh, that has come into use. Basically what it is, is it's, it's a very, um, very neat setup where I can control these things. I can control the temperature so I can make it very comfortable for the patient. I can control the liter flow. It goes, most of them go to 40 or some of them go to 60 liters per minute. And I can control my oxygen percentage. So I can go anywhere from room air. I may be on 21% oxygen and 60 liters. Okay, for example, a diabetic may be having too small breathing and they don't need oxygen, but they're trying to blow off their uh, acid. So, or we may have this on 100% and this on 60. So this is very, very comfortable to the patient. It's heated, it's humidified 100% because there is a separate humidification system. So this, if any of you have tried, it's very warm air, it's humidified, it's very comfortable. Your nose doesn't burn. And it it's, has been a lifesaver, particularly in this COVID. We used to have three units before the COVID, then we had to buy 30 more because the demand was so much. And in fact, if you put a, a mask on top, one of these, one of the problems with uh, all of these open delivery systems is whether you are exposing the healthcare workers to COVID because of the high flows and so on. So we usually put a mask on top of the patient to reduce the risk for the um, healthcare workers. So one of the advantages of high flow system because you're blowing 40 liters, 50 liters, 60 liters is that uh, it washes off the air in the nasopharynx, so you have some removal of CO2 as well. So there's some advantage of uh, ventilating in addition to uh, oxygenating. These are various studies. It really is um, not a question of trying to prove anymore. It's been proven that it's uh, quite comparable to non-invasive ventilation. It has avoided intubation, it has avoided reintubation and so on, both in surgical as well as medical settings. The advantages are, as I mentioned, heated, humidified oxygen up to 100%, washes out nasopharynx, so PCO2 is lower, decreased worker breathing, it avoids intubation, facilitates extubation. Uh, it can also produce some low amount of uh, PEEP. For example, for every 10 liters, there may be one to two centimeters of PEEP. So if you're on high flows, you may even have eight to 10 centimeters of PEEP, which improves, improves your um, oxygenation. So you can have both non-invasive ventilation and high flow. What is the difference between non-invasive ventilation and high flow? Here you have heated humidified oxygen. Non-invasive ventilation actually can rest the respiratory muscles because you're actually giving um, some uh, support for uh, tidal volume. So the, the big controversy initially, I don't know if you're still going through, is whether you're going to, uh, with any of these non-invasive or nebulizer or venturi mask, any of those, are you going to have the virus come out because it's an open system? And they have shown that if you put a mask on any of those, actually the, the viral particles coming out and contaminating is not um, that significant. So what about uh, non-invasive ventilation? Uh, non-invasive ventilation was used quite a bit by, by Italians. And you want to use in these patients um, um, with COVID because you don't want them to um, get exposed healthcare workers to the virus, we use a full total face mask with a filter, uh, with a viral filter or a helmet or a bubble uh, mask with a filter again. That way, uh, you know, the virus is not being, it's, it's a filter that filters it out. So here, um, the amount of gas, this has to be completely inflated. And uh, the way you reduce the work of breathing is you have to have the patients on BiPAP uh, if you have to remove the CO2, which means the, um, the difference between inspiratory pressure and expiratory pressure, the higher it is, the more CO2 you remove. 
So this is how, this is a newer system. We used to use, actually in US, there has been a problem of supply of these uh, helmet masks. People were using some diverse type of masks which were not very good. And this is a new system that you have, which is uh, actually quite comfortable to the patients and patient will look like this. And you can put a nasogastric tube that can come out of a side hole here and you fill the air and there is a, a seal around the neck so it doesn't float up. And you usually use, uh, you know, in this example, 10 to 12 of PEEP, a pressure support of 10 to 12 and you can titrate your oxygen up or down. Um, this is a study from Italy that shows that um, the uh, incidence of intubation was less when the patients were used uh, uh, helmet versus high flow nasal oxygen. However, the mortality at 28 days was no different between the, between the groups. I think I will probably um, uh, stop after a couple of slides. I won't go into proning. So um, to avoid intubation nasal cannula, if they need very few, uh, you know, if their oxygenation is okay and they can just be managed with nasal cannula, you start with that. Minimal humidity, nose can burn if you're going higher. Non-rebreather mask is um, high FiO2, but humidity is low. High flow nasal cannula, I can go from room A to 100%. 100% heated and humidified. So if I'm going to high flow nasal cannula system, we should start at high flow. Don't give them 15 liters or something. Start at 40 liters. And then you can come down uh, depending on uh, the flow rate of the patient. Non-invasive ventilation, we usually start 12 over five and then we up titrate depending on the work of breathing. Um, proning is with... Um, uh, spontaneous or uh, ventilator cloning. Uh, so I think I'll stop here and then we can go through the other um, concepts and controversies later on, if it's okay with you. Dr. Ram, is it okay? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Guntupalli. We will have, I have several questions to both of you, but can I get the first two? I was confused by PSI ally. Can you explain that? Uh, patient self-induced lung injury? Yeah, well, one of the things is um, um, in the lung injury, we used to think that it's a pressure that was causing the lung injury. You can take um, uh, lungs and you can just uh, ventilate them with um, high tidal volume. And you have actually uh, the lungs can develop something like ARDS in few hours. So it's a large volume ventilation that actually causes uh, the lung injury. So what happens after some time, let's say you have COVID pneumonia, some sort of a pneumonia. Uh, what happens is after some time when you're doing this large volume ventilation, you have the, uh, injury due to volume or volume trauma. It's, it's called volume trauma on top of whatever is going on. And a, an infected lung or an inflamed lung is more susceptible to uh, volume trauma. What P PCLE is patient self-induced lung injury. So if a patient is doing these large volume breaths, for example, um, 700 cc's, 800 cc's, um, then even that is harmful to the patient. So some of the reasons why they think that Patients with COVID, because of this uh, happy hypoxic nature that they don't, you know, they don't complain, they don't perceive that they are breathing. They think that maybe patients are having these large volume breaths for three, four, five days at home, have injured their lungs on top of their inflammation, and they're going into ARDS. So that's uh, one concept. In fact, it's not just with COVID, even in ARDS patients, if a patient has these large tidal volumes, we, we intubate them and we reduce their volume by mechanically ventilating them because it can exacerbate the already lung injury. I, when I meet the Baba Ramdev next week, I will warn him. Um, I mean, those are just, uh, you know, you're not doing it all the time, you see. You may uh, be just doing it during a yogic practice or yogic exercise. Now, there are five, 400 patients in one building in Andhra Medical College, and it's a terrible disease. There may be a lot of code blues. I didn't understand LUCAS. It's an acronym for a way you conduct a code. 
No, Lucas, I can I can maybe show it the next time or I have a, let me see if I have the Lucas on this. Okay. Can you see my screen or not? Yes, yes. Okay, this is Lucas. I was going to go through. Basically, it's a mechanical compression device. Uh, let me show you. And it is... Um, on them to automatically do can you see it? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it doesn't get... This is a device we can put on them to automatically do chest compressions. And uh, it doesn't get tired. It'll keep doing chest compressions at a rate of 100 beats per minute uh, for basically indefinitely. And it, it, it delivers a higher quality. So this is a mechanical device. And this is, for example, the, the code team um, re, re assignment that we have because we want to keep the number of people in the room to a minimum. Normally, what happens is uh, we take the crash cart inside the patient's room. And uh, because of the COVID, we have to throw everything that is in the crash cart, uh, throw it out. So we are losing a lot of resources. So we keep uh, how many people are outside the room and how many inside the room. And who's inside the room is you have to rotate the compressors every two minutes. Those are the highest number of turnover. So we got these Lucas devices now that, you know, then the device can go on indefinitely. If you have half an hour, 45 minutes, whatever, it doesn't get tired. And it gives a very reliable compression. So we acquired four of those and uh, the crash uh, code team carries that with them. I'm now going to read a bunch of questions that are already in the chat box. Some of them are meant for Dr. Gopinath, many meant for you. Does the increased use of steam inhalations in India, is it anywhere associated with increased mucormycosis incidence? Dr. Gopinath. Um. You know, it's hard, it's hard to know. Actually, I know steam inhalation has has been, you know, uh, uh, practiced quite commonly. Um, as far as I know, I think it depends on, I mean, assuming that your water is clean and so on, I, I don't know that that would be a, a major risk factor unless, you know, there was so much steam that you were somehow damaging the nasal epithelium, epithelium as well. So um, not as far as I know. And... Uh... We already asked the question regarding the uh, all Indian Institute of Medical Science practice of the, in the mild disease protocol, butycinide therapy is included. Is that, that useful in the mild disease? Uh, I suppose the question can be asked if the person has, is minimally ill, should that be used or should it be used as a inhaled steroid in the steroid category? I mean, we don't use it, uh, you know, especially in acutely ill patients. Um, we don't use this, but you know, uh, uh, we don't use this in, uh, in um, you know, acutely ill patients, but I have seen those recommendations from the ICMR. Um, I mean, it doesn't suppress a general inflammation. It may suppress some inflammation in the lung and usually it doesn't act right away. It does take some time, any inhaled steroid. It will take several days for it to kick in. I mean, I, I think it's not, it's not uh, harmful. It's better than taking uh, oral steroids when you don't need it. Dr. Uh, <clears throat> Opinath, you addressed uh, remdesivir. Is there any experience with combining remdesivir with the barcitinib? Yeah, so, um, so the NIH guidelines, for example, recommend the use of uh, baricitinib and remdesivir if steroids can't be used. So in people who are on supplemental oxygen, um, and uh, so, they, so it, in, in, um, in the ACT2 clinical trial, the use of the two of them together, remdesivir and baricitinib, actually uh, decreased the, um, the time to recovery uh, was shorter than, than remdesivir alone, and also seemed to have some effect um, in terms of progression. So I think um, our guidelines currently recommend that uh, it's only if for whatever reason you do not want to use steroids uh, that um, uh, you can combine uh, remdesivir and baricitinib. Thank you. 
is uh, Dr. Gundupalli. Your thoughts on awake proning uh, in COVID? I think Dr. Isukapalli, if you could speak up, you might ask the question yourself. I'm having difficulty reading what you wrote. Mani Garu? Okay. She might come back. Uh, I mean, I can answer. I think if she's yeah. asking, if we, we use it quite extensively, actually. Um, there's a large study that um, hasn't been published yet uh, through CHEST, uh, multi-center. So we use it quite ex extensively. In fact, that was kind of unheard of before uh, this COVID um, pandemic. So patients, we encourage them to be prone um, unless they're very obese and have a you know, are unable to lie down. I've seen patients kind of 15 hours, they're proning. They're just supining just to eat and then they're prone again. And I've seen that, you know, we have a protocol. I was going to do all the proning maybe in the next session. Um, you know, I can show you exactly, uh, you know, how we monitor them and what are the pre-checklist and, you know, awake proning. Yes, we use it quite extensively even with um, high flow nasal cannula, everything. Dr. Chandrasekhar is running our large unit in King George Hospital. He received some oxygen concentrators and he has a fair question. How best can we use these oxygen concentrators? Should we be using them in high home isolation in the beginning, encouraging people to stay home and give them the oxygenator rather than letting them come into the hospital? Or I think that uh, I have seen, um, I have been talking to some people, even non-doctors and people, community workers who are trying to help patients stay home are using these. So home, I mean, home oxygen concentrators, we have been using for years for COPD patients. We give them home and it's an unlimited supply of oxygen. As long as there's room air, it's making oxygen at low levels. Most of the COPD patients are on, two to three liters, that's all. That's why it works well. So if a patient is at home, patient has COVID, they're mildly short of breath and their oxygen saturation is less than 92%, you can give oxygen concentrator, let them stay home, see if they, uh, they don't block a hospital bed. You know, If they don't have beds, this is a reasonable. I've seen, I've been talking to some people in Bangalore and other places where they're taking finger oximetry to patients home when they call. They measure it, and if it's low, they give them oxygen concentrator. So I think you can treat one patient at a time uh, for mild disease, you know. And if you can get the oxygen saturation up, then you know it may avoid hospitalization. And you can give steroids at home in the, to, to those patients who require oxygen. So I think it's it's a decent one. Um, that's not something typically we use in the hospitals. I've never used concentrator in a hospital setting because you have piped in oxygen. But if you're having oxygen shortage, it's not bad. It's like getting a oxygen out of a cylinder. It doesn't matter where you get the oxygen from. Yes. But remember that this only makes up to four liters of 100%. Uh, the, you may crank up the flow to 15 liters. At 15 liters, you may get 40%. So don't fool yourself that you're getting 100 that's all. So you would and agree humidity with is you. very low. Humidity yeah. is very low. Once you cross four liters, the nose starts burning. The tolerance will go down. So it's fair to tell him then, case selection, he finds the ideal patient, educated enough, meaning he understands how to handle it. Let them go home and use the concentrator rather than flood the building while emitting aerosolized virus particles into the room. So I think that Correct. was a concern because he has this huge hospital now with 400 patients breathing out all the time. So Dr. Sekhar, you want to ask more questions on that topic? No, sir. Uh, it is clear. Only thing is, uh, if we can frame certain protocols or guidelines, uh, even the, all the oxygen beds need not be filled and some of the patients in the triage or other places can be managed with these uh, uh, oxygen concentrators. So that the and they, they can self-prone. Even at home, they can self-prone, you know? They can self-prone. Yes, that is what we have oxygen. been advising. 
yeah you can see the oxygen concentration you know oximetry finger oximetry is very i'm sure it's extensively available it's quite affordable and they can monitor it you know and in fact when they are prone a lot of times i can go down on my oxygen percentage like even on high flow i may go for, i have patients i go from 80% to 30% when they are prone you know once they are supine if, as long as they are not lungs are not very stable you know it, they may require more but you know it's better to require high oxygen more than 50% for 2 hours or 4 hours rather than 24 hours because it will make ards in your lung if you use very high oxygen for long time i think one other thing that has been bothering me is i run the post covid clinic now when i see some of the patients we get from other hospitals also i've seen one patient who was on high flow oxygen 80% for 50 days and has lung fibrosis so we have to be just because patient is not intubated uh we should be very sensitive that the high oxygen is going to be harmful to the lungs so you have to get it down as much as possible as quickly as possible thank you madam madam can we in the same way uh, discharge policy we can can we adapt shifting some of these patients uh, from the wards to uh, discharge with oxygen concentrators so that we way also all we can the time. Yeah. we do it all the time here yeah, of course it we, is not so yes, uh, we do it all the time we arrange for home oxygen for these patients and i see them 30 days later and i do a 6 minute what is called a 6 minute walk test and if they don't desaturate um less than 90% or even less than 88% then i discontinue their oxygen there are Thank specific you. criteria so we do it, it all the time his associate his associate asks would there be any benefit if a moderate disease patient is kept on nasal nasal cannula with a n95 mask over the cannula i mean i won't put n95 mask because that is quite restrictive you know it won't let anything come in regular surgical mask may be okay just to conserve oxygen you want to make sure they don't breathe the co2 also you know Next question is what is the ideal time to wean off a patient with severe disease from NIV to high flow nasal oxygen the patient is not maintaining saturations more than 90% I mean the I think it's a uh, one of the monitoring things is a clinical if they are going from NIV to high flow and the respiratory rate goes up it's not just the oxygen the so work of breathing goes up then probably they are not ready you know sometimes we alternate non invasive to with high flow you know they are on high flow for a while and then they go on non invasive maybe at night just remember that a lot of these patients um have a uh, obstructive sleep apnea as well so at night they may need the non invasive or uh, cpap or bipap okay dr gopinath this one is for you uh, we lost 150000 patients last year 2020 in india we did not hear about mucormycosis what was different this year and a lot has been said about it we wanted to hear what you think is going on in india yeah no it's a it's an excellent question i think it's kind of been very interesting to all of us uh, and and terrible for people who are actually dealing with it it's it's kind of it's kind of really unclear i mean the there are far more cases of covid now um than there were in the first uh, wave and so whether it is just a simple matter of uh, sheer numbers so the as i showed you in one of the slides mucormycosis is no stranger to india and certainly the um the major risk factor is uh is diabetes and especially uncontrolled <laughs> a so whether it is just that we are seeing far more cases of covid now and therefore you're also seeing um uh, uh, more mucor it, uh, it it's it's unclear i mean i think um so far it looks like the usual risk factors diabetes immunosuppression steroid use are still um the factors at play uh, but again i mean you know there's there's new information and evidence uh, emerging every every day pretty much 
I mean, we and, have had 2,000 cases and we have not seen any muc. I've seen in all these years, maybe four cases of rhinocerebral mucor mycosis and pa one patient had to have both eyes taken out, but patients survived. Mortality is high. They have seen in patients with severe diabetes, very poorly controlled diabetes. And I think maybe, I think it's a indiscriminate use of steroids. I actually saw uh, some of the prescriptions that are given unbelievable just with the diagnosis of COVID, they're getting large doses, even 500 milligrams of solimedrol, you know, methylprednisolone, and then clopidogrel, mm. all kinds of uh, things. I think they're being blasted. And even the diabetes prevalence is very high in India. And I think it's going out of control. If in the hospital we are using, you know, larger doses of steroids, we control their blood sugar. We increase the sliding scale. We increase their you know, baseline or put them on insulin drip until we can control it. I think this is happening at home without any control. Yeah, no, I think I, I think I think you're right with that. The I think the steroids have a lot to do with it. I mean, as I said, the anecdotal information that I have is 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 uh, you know, there's all sorts of steroids being used. Um, you know, in the early phase when when actually. Uh, potentially it could act to the patient's detriment because that is the stage of, of active viral replication. And so you don't really want to use steroids at that time, but yeah. The next question is coming from a young doctor from here who's actually managing a relative in India. I happen to know the case. What is the role of monoclonal antibodies on day three post ICU admission with O2 sat 98% on high flow oxygen but the respiratory rate is 35, is already on remdesivir and steroids. Would you add monoclonal antibodies if it's available? So here, um, the, the current recommendations for um, the use of monoclonal antibodies are in patients with mild to moderate COVID who are at risk for progression to severe disease, and so, or severe or critical disease. So. I think um, you know from from the brief description here, it doesn't uh, sound like this patient is is uh, fits that profile because it sounds like they have have uh, you know been uh, sort of downgraded from the ICU. So hopefully that means that they are um, improving. Um, but uh, I would say uh, probably no role at this point. Uh, I agree, and I think that um, uh, sometimes these patients remain tachypneic and you know the length of stay normally in ARDS normal length of stay in the past has been like four to five days even proning when we do in intubated ARDS patients at the most the, the Proceva study which I will share maybe in the next talk is four sessions of 16 hours a day proning these patients what we are finding is that the, some of these patients required proning for two weeks three weeks so this is a little bit of a different, it's not the principle of treatment the same, that seems to be more stubborn and prolonged ARDS. But I read a question within this question, not so much about respiratory management, it's only day three. If there was ever going to be monoclonal antibody, should it be today? Well, it's... Uh, uh, if I understood it correctly, it, it sounds like it was day three post ICU admission. So in other words, the patient presumably has been through the initial stage, has then had severe uh, um, COVID uh, and is now getting better. That's the way that I understand the question, unless I, uh, unless I misunderstood. So in that situation, there would not be uh, any role. I will prompt the young lady to speak up. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Karam. Actually, uh, that's the patient I was discussing about. He is currently in ICU. Uh, it was a type of error. So he's currently in ICU and uh, he is receiving high flow oxygen with an IV in between. And uh, his respiratory rate is being maintained between 30 and 35. And he is an uncontrolled diabetic with immunosuppressant therapy going on for... Uh, chemotherapy going on for his multiple myeloma as well mm. so we're actually discussing about uh, his uh, treatment and uh, contacting my friend in india hyderabad so we were discussing about the iv monoclonal antibodies so is there any role of that and i would also like to ask about his 
like what would be the further course of treatment in this case and what would be the prognosis if you could throw some light on that as well sure first of all i'm so sorry that you're going through that your father-in-law is going through that i know there's it's 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 just been a, a, a terrible situation for so many um, so, I mean, even with that, I think just just from a, a pathophysiological point of view, I mean, by the time um, he is, uh, I presume that he he has pneumonia and uh, pretend, I mean, luckily he's he's on high flow and, and doesn't require anything else at this point. But uh, I, I would still think as, as, as far as I can, uh, as far as I know, I, I don't, I think the time for the monoclonal antibodies, again, the purpose of those are to sort of uh sort of to to combat the virus uh particularly and if he's sort of past the stage of really active viral replication and is really more in the inflammatory stage it may not um, make much of a difference at all um unfortunately uh just and i would just say that um that you know the course as uh, dr guntapoli was saying is usually extremely prolonged in, in and especially with the kind of risk factors that your father-in-law has. So, um, um, you know, I, I, I don't know that it would help. I don't know that there would be anything else from a therapeutic standpoint that would help at this stage, uh, rather other than the uh, tincture of time and just really aggressive support, supportive care. Um, uh, Dr. Guntapal, you have anything else to add to that? Uh, I agree with you. I think that uh, from the parameters you are giving, He's not doing badly. I mean, I would be, he's still on, you know, non-invasive ventilation, respiratory rate is not, you know, that high. I mean, um, to me, I would, I would be reasonably happy with that kind of a profile. The next question comes from Dr. Budhraju. Um, Dr. Budhraju, ask the question yourself because you are familiar with this topic. Speak up, please. Uh, so the uh, so the uh, um, government of India as well as uh, the state governments are talking about using monoclonal antibodies in high risk patients with early COVID uh, infections. So these the two cocktails that had uh, the EUA in US uh, were basically designed against uh, the initial uh, the strains. Um, and so with uh, mutations in the RBD uh, and the double mutant. Uh, that is now uh, widespread in India. Would that be an issue? I thought, uh, uh, you know, this, the FDA had issued some guidance and warnings yeah. about potentially, you know, issue of uh, mutations and ineffectiveness of these monoclonal antibodies. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I um, uh, you know, to my knowledge, all of that information is still uh, to be gathered. Uh, I think we're sort of still in the early stages. Um, I think there, there's a lot of interest, of obviously, in whether the monoclonal antibodies will be helpful, whether the vaccines will be protective um, because of these new variants. And, um, you know, I, I haven't yet seen any data that, that sort of really speaks to that. Um, so far, certainly with vaccines, it seems like they are, uh, uh, you know, certainly partially, at least partially and probably more than just partially protective. Um, I haven't seen any any specific data regarding monoclonal antibodies, um, you know, for uh, you know, like the B one six one seven variant. I am can I comment, Dr. Um, Malampali yes. here? Yes. Please go well, ahead. The, sir. the the role of monoclonal antibodies um, were being established in uh, non oxygenated patients rather than the oxygenated patients. Um, but for the oxygenated patients are already who are in intensive care on the ventilator, I don't think they have any role. I don't know if that answers the question. In a way it does. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Manoj Patrini has an interesting challenge question. May not address you directly, but I am going to take the courage to address Dr. Sudhakar himself. To end this complication with COVID by steroid abuse in India, the government should ban over the counter sale of steroids. So, are you going to pick up something like this, or we are not able to handle the over, over the counter sale of drugs in India? Uh, 
it's very difficult to ban the over the counter sales of drugs in india because there is not enough machinery to handle that it's very difficult to impose the restrictions uh, so there was a attempt there was an attempt about 5 years ago to do that but it was futile so um, it's not possible at this moment uh, particularly in a situation uh, that we are going through uh, so that's not possible for the time being so it's only the awareness that makes all the difference the last question from the chat box what is the role of stem cell therapy in moderate to severe disease first to dr kuntupalli i have no experience and I, i know there are some studies coming out of baylor but you know i have no experience with that or opinion yeah i would i would sort of i would sort of say likewise at this point i think it's it's very early um currently um no real data on which to recommend uh dr prasad rao has a question sir no okay i go ahead can, can i speak yes okay. yes this is for you dr ram mohan i think are you from the andhra medical college yes i am a 1964 batch okay i i am 19 i don't know when i passed but anyway <laughs> i was a student of andhra medical college <laughs> the question i have is the i was listening to all the conferences and the, all the talks about the covid infections and the what i hear what's happening in india is quite different than what i am hearing in these conferences in the night time i am a pulmonary and critical care doctor and we wanted to support them in our organizations here and give a lot of um, the bipap machines and oxygen concentrators i don't know what i gathered from them is that why you guys are giving us our oxygen concentrators our patients are so so sick okay they can't produce enough oxygen and these are not very useful for us is that really true you have a lot of uh, oxygen concentrators available for you i i can partially answer that i have been watching this traffic for the last three and a half weeks well meaning people keep hearing that there's not enough oxygen that means while waiting early on while waiting to go to the icu there may not be enough piped oxygen from the wall in the wards and there we heard a lot of people are actually in serious trouble at home trying to get to the hospital and we also heard there is no there is a great shortage of beds so it was not easy to send an oxygen plant an oxygen generator that takes weeks so i think well meaning people okay what else can i send you can send oxygen tank <coughs> oxygen concentrator seemed logical so i saw at least five or six groups of people sending 30 50 30 50 i would not stop them because dr sekar pointed out a little while ago that the less severe people could be handled could be managed by the oxygen concentrators or probably they could even be handled in the outlying hospitals where the less sick people are being kept so it's up to you all how to use them but it's not easy to stop generous people yeah. i have talked to some friends in uh, uh, vasadragar in uh, delhi and other people who are on the ground and uh, because this is going into the rural areas where there is no big medical facilities they felt that this is still useful to manage patients that's what yeah, i thought uh, yeah. so yeah yeah but but, but, yeah, then, but then they told us okay you, you guys don't send these oxygen concentrators we can't make use of these things so i was kind of a little surprised the other unfortunate thing is that i lost my brother in vaizag area okay from the covid okay with the lack of beds in kgh and in vijayanagaram 
and we had to go to a, a far away place and where there is an oxygen available there. Okay, so I know, but the it looks like it, there are two different walls. On one side, okay, they are not getting all the things what they can be getting, but on the other side, we are talking about um, okay, various medications on, on maybe using whatever the protocol from the Indian Association, they said that they are following everything, whatever they're in the book or the, whatever the publication is. But uh, anyway, I'm glad that uh, you notified me that still there is a use for the oxygen concentrators, okay, in Andhra and Madras area. Thank you for yeah, the comment. Yeah. Yeah, Ramohan, if I am allowed to say something. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I do not know the source of information to Dr. Prasad Rao, uh, but definitely there is a role, particularly in the uh, strategies that we are developing to decentralize the care. Uh, patients with mild disease or mild to moderate need not be shifted to Vizag or Vijayanagaram or places like that. And we are thinking of these oxygen concentrators to be distributed to the mandal level. So with adequate uh, training to all those doctors so that they can be used there. And, so, and the unnecessary travel and unnecessary shifting to the higher centers can be avoided accordingly. So in nutshell, uh, they are useful and they'll be put to good use. Thank you. Thank you to hear that. We'll try to continue the okay, gather our resources to send oxygen concentrators. I mean, I, I know that there are quite a few uh, physicians from USA are also on this um, in the audience. Uh, one of the things that Seva is doing is uh, by writing to the patients, especially pulmonary practitioners, uh, just one email from one uh, practitioner from uh, Atlanta got about 300 CPAP, BiPAP units because a lot of our patients have extra and they're sitting on the shelf. So they're mailing it to a warehouse in Atlanta and they're being shipped to India. You can do targeted donation, but they'll go to the whoever is the needy. Yeah, so RP, like from so RP, RP is actually help, uh, helping us do that. So for example, me and my wife uh, sent about uh, three concentrators and several BiPAP and CPAP devices. And all we had to do, uh, do was drop it off at an RP office. Um, that's one way to do it. The other way we were doing it was order and uh, send them to DHL to our villages. And I think at villages, we see a lot of use because they're waiting for 24, 48 hours, 72 hours sometimes to find a bed. And those borderline cases, the oxygen concentrators are, I think, definitely helping in the villages. Yeah, RP has uh, sent through, they sent through Seva again. It goes through Atlanta. Dr. Sudhakar allowed me a couple more minutes. I have one more question for you, Dr. Kuntupalli. Should oral anticoagulants be used in a post-COVID discharge patient maintained on non-rebreathable mask while in hospital, but the problem is has varicose veins? Should anticoagulants be used, continued, and for how long? I mean, it's quite uh, controversial that the only, even from American Society of Hematology, that. They recommend, they are recommending something we already know. They said if they're in the hospital, use prophylactic heparin if there's no contraindication. If they have a DVT or a PE, you do full anticoagulation, which we know. There's nothing new about it. I have, I mean, it seems like it's quite uh, individual. If the patient, sometimes I've seen patients who are anticoagulation are continued for two more weeks before when they go home or 30 days when they go home. Um, so I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. I have seen patients who are on full anticoagulation and had a cardiac arrest with heart and all the arteries full of uh, veins, full of clots. So I think it's, um, it's very hard. And one of these days I'll bring uh, my chief hematologist and we can have a discussion. Even in our own group, we have different ways. One hospital that does 
there's no rationale for it, but anybody who is in the ICU, they anticoagulate not to 70 PTT, but like maybe above like 35 or 40, like 40 PTT. Some people are using TEG in the hospital. And when they're going home, they're anticoagulating. Some of them are doing for two weeks, some of them are doing for 30 days, some of them are not. So I, I don't think there's hard and fast rule. Uh, Dr. Seems... Man, I, I, I have one patient, same like that. I can just share my experience here, whom I have um, given them the enhanced home care management. This patient is quite a young chap, a diagnosed with a DVT. He is on Rivarox ban, 30 milligram a day throughout his lifetime, diagnosed with COVID, obviously. And uh, I have, yes, continued him on a decent dose of um, uh, Clexane, uh, which I have continued actually 40 milligram BD on him, and he's weighing around uh, 90 kilo. Um, I continued up to a week even after his uh, recovery, and then I have switched him back to his Rivarox band. So I feel definitely individuals with DVT and diagnosed varicose veins should be continued on the uh, prophylactic dose, uh, sorry, the therapeutic dose rather than the prophylactic dose. Uh, that's uh, my experience. I mean, if they have DVT, we definitely will continue whether it's a provoked or unprovoked, you know? depending on whether it's provoked or unprovoked. Uh, but generally patients with COVID going home, do you anticoagulate? Do you anticoagulate them in the hospital? Is um, I think seems like it's still very individualistic. So there's a there, there are three large randomized uh, trials that are ongoing right now. And there should be an interim analysis, I think within the next couple of weeks. And I think American Society of Hematology is waiting for that interim analysis to give up kind of a final guidelines. But the current American Society of Hematology guidelines are not based on evidence. Basically, they're just a panel that recommended a set of guidelines. There is a, there is a 450 patients or so from Mount Sinai. They, they showed good results with anticoagulation. Um, so even in our own group of 50 intensivists, it's a little... It's different. We have a trial with TPA that was done, you know, in these patients. They haven't analyzed. So it's kind of, you know, all over the place. But I think prophylactic heparin, um, no question, everybody in the hospital, we're doing it. If they have DVT or PE, of course, we anticoagulate them and extend it when they get discharged. So hopefully the trials would give us some information. There are 125 people listening right now. There were 160 at one time, but I do want to read out something that Dr. Manoj wrote. He's actually one of the physicians handling the CSR block. And we already discussed oxygen concentrators. He says, as of now, peri-urban, rural, and tribal areas, the incidence of COVID are more higher in India. So the outreach areas are in need of oxygen concentrators which will definitely make a great difference in the pandemic situation. So if there are willing donors here, I actually believe oxygen concentrators are a good gift to give away. And I want to close this by saying something interesting, that Dr. Naveen is a frequent participant in this list, although I want to read what he wrote. Uh, as a way of thanking both of them and making a comment regarding Dr. Guntupalli. Dr. Kalpalata Guntupalli has a big role in the development of critical care in Hyderabad. He's a big name in critical care, maybe across the globe. Our guru, Dr. Ravindra Babu, used to work in close association with her in developing critical care in Vizag. We have been seeing her for the, from our PG days. Thank you, madam, for being on this program. Do come again from Dr. Naveen. So with that, I want to thank Dr. Guntupalli for her time and attention and the amount of detail that she provided and for bringing along Dr. Gopinath. Uh, Ramya Garu, thank you very much for being here. I don't know if you are a native Telugu speaker or Tamil speaker, you sound like you could be a Tamil speaker. Are you? Uh, so <laughs> that, that's an interesting story. I'm actually, I speak Marathi at home, but uh, I learned Tamil when I was in medical school. So I she speaks Telugu little bit. She understands Garu very well. Yeah, yeah. Her mom lives in Andhra Pradesh. 
we might ask both of you to come back because it looks like this disease is really, really got us by expletive deleting. Thank you very much. Good night. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you for inviting us. Bye-bye. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Dr. Sudhakar. Dr. Sudhakar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Ramo. It's okay. Uh, you can wind up anytime, no problem. And I profusely thank Dr. Kuklata and Dr. Ramya uh, for having come on the show. And uh, we look forward for their, more part uh, for their participation more often. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, at this end, let us uh, take leave. Thank you. Yeah, I hope to cover other areas next time. Yes. Like proning and ventilator management. There are so many aspects I thought we'll stick to small segments of each. You know. I'll call you separately, ma'am. And thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Thank Shekhar, you. can you give me a call, please? Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. <clears throat>